Hey, this is Jacob Evan. Thanks for tuning in. In one of our recent discussions, there was a question that arose about some of these passages that you've probably noticed in the Torah. If you're reading an English translation, it might read something like, If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, or these are the statutes and judgments and laws. Various passages where it will list these different categories of law or words which are used which roughly appear synonymous but for some reason they are being distinguished between one another and so the question that arose is what is the difference is there some kind of distinction here clearly there is but what is the purpose behind the distinction what is the meaning of each of these words so over the past few days, in conjunction with previous research that I have done regarding some of these words, this is something that I've been looking at, and I thought I would share some of my observations of the patterns regarding these particular words. Of course, each of these words tends to represent a particular Hebrew word. Now, one tricky thing about most translations is that most translations are not entirely consistent. So. The temptation might be to look across different passages in English or use an English concordance and then say, okay, if it says statutes here and it says statutes here, surely that's the same Hebrew word. But that's not actually how it is a lot of the times with this issue and with other issues. And so that's why it's important to, if you're approaching it from that way, to use a Hebrew concordance instead. And so if you are wanting to look into that on your own, that's what I would suggest, either something like Englishman's Hebrew Concordance or a interlinear tool like ISA2, Interlinear Scripture Analyzer Version 2, and that would apply to basically any issue of Torah study that we're going to have to be paying attention to the Hebrew, we're going to have to be getting back to the Hebrew wordings, the Hebrew categories of meaning, the Hebrew text. As I delved into this issue, I looked at six particular Hebrew words and their respective forms. And those words are hukah, hok, mitzvah, or miswah, mishpat, torah, and mishmeret. And superficially, just at first glance, it appears that there's not an obvious pattern, at least for some of them, that some of them appear very often just seemingly speaking generally. That it's just talking about commandments in general. But there are some patterns which I observed, and I want to go into those with each individual word. The first one we're going to look at is hukah, and this shows up, for example, in Leviticus 26 a number of times. It shows up in verse 3 when it's talking about if you walk in his hukot, and likewise in verse 15, whenever it's talking about if you reject his hukot. And some similar wordings show up in Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy 6.2, it talks about guarding all of them. In Deuteronomy 28, it shows up with if you don't listen, and then to guard to do his hukot. And likewise in verse 45, you did not guard his hukot. I'm paraphrasing here, but... Those are some of the ways that it shows up, at least very generally. But there are some patterns otherwise for this particular word. And one of them that many of you will call to mind is the connection with olam, which is translated usually as something like forever, or eternal, or perpetual. So when you see an eternal commandment or something like that in a translation, usually it is using this word. Now, I did a video a while back on the precise meaning of olam as I understand it. If you're interested in that, feel free to check it out. But I will briefly say that usually it could be translated as something like enduring or long enduring. And interestingly, this tends to show up on commands that a lot of people would try to argue are not relevant anymore. Commands regarding certain rituals commands regarding certain things which are allowed or not allowed, yet in common practice would be dismissed. For example, in Leviticus 3.17, regarding not eating any blood and not eating any fat, or as I would understand it, the fat around the organs, the tallow. It shows up in Exodus 27.21, regarding Aaron and his sons, 
tending to the lamps of the tent of meeting, and with Aaron and his sons wearing particular garments in accordance with the tent of meeting in Exodus 28.43. The word hukah and its different forms show up a number of times with regard to the rules about the tent of meeting. It's not the only word that shows up with that regard, but that is a pattern to it that I am seeing. And also it shows up with some of the different festivals and observances, such as Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread, Day of Covering, also known as Day of Atonement, Shavuot, and Sukkot. There are a few times, especially toward the end of the Book of Numbers, where the word is used in conjunction with another one of the words we're going to look at. For example, Terah in reference to the red heifer offering, and also with mishpat in connection with the manslaughter rules and the rules regarding passing inheritance in the case that a man does not have a son. The word is used a few other times in the Torah aside from all of these examples, and some of those include reiterations to do it or to not not do it. That's all I have for hukah, and the next word is a related word, which is just poke, and it's used similarly to the first word, but there are a few differences. So it shows up a number of times with olam, with perpetual, eternal, enduring, just like with the previous word, and it also shows up with the Passover, and it shows up with a number of the rules involving Aaron and involving the tent of the meeting and the observances around that, and what would otherwise be considered rituals. Most of the clear examples of this word, that is, whenever it's clearly connected with some specific thing, rather than just speaking generally about following them or making them known and such, those tend to be things like Aaron washing his hands and his feet as he's approaching the tent of meeting and the altar, the bread of the presence, or the show bread, as it's sometimes translated. And one unique way that is used when compared with hukah is that it appears to carry this implication of an appointed portion or an appointed responsibility. And so we see it often in connection with the portion that Aaron is given out of particular offerings, the portion that he is reserved or is supposed to eat, and how that is handled. Otherwise, it shows up with destruction of the worship sites in the land, described in Deuteronomy 12, and the Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal ritual described in Deuteronomy 27, and also the rules regarding oaths and nullification of oaths, as described in Numbers 30. Aside from that, most of the other examples tend to be just emphasizing they are supposed to be done, emphasizing to guard, to do them, and to guard and do them. So for the most part, it tends to deal with ritual commands, commands regarding responsibilities relating to the rituals and relating to assigned portions out of the offerings to Aaron. That is what tends to show up with hok. Next, I want to go into mitzvah or miswah, which could be translated as command or order. And what I see is that it's often used very generically. It's used for all of the commands or summing up the commands of a book, talking about doing all the commands or violating commands. In fact, I did not notice any clear examples where some specific command was obviously referred to just by this word. Instead, most of the passages talk about doing them or not doing them, for example, if a person sins and does from any of them which shall not be done, or verses toward the end of books, like the end of Leviticus and the end of Numbers, that are just saying that these are the mitzvot. And also in Deuteronomy 4.2, it refers to not adding to or diminishing from the word, and then it says to guard mitzvot. So how I am understanding this is that it's used generally that it's used for essentially any command of any type. Next is mishpat, and there's a clear connection with the etymology of this word to the verb for to judge, or one of the verbs which refer to judging. And so this could easily be translated as judgment. There are a lot of examples where that is clearly what is being referred to, talking about issues of judgment. 
like standing for judgment or judgment of death or a single manner of judgment which is being done on damages or things like that. And uniquely, there is actually a passage where this word is used frequently and where it appears that the passage begins and ends with specifying that these are judgments, where it refers to the mishpatim. And this is from Exodus 21.1 to Exodus 24.3. And what I see in this passage and some of the other passages that it shows up is that it often refers to the manner in which something has already been commanded to be done. Like in Exodus 21.9 and Exodus 21.31, it appears to just refer to, in this case, you're still handling it the way it was already commanded to be done, paraphrasing. And likewise, this shows up regarding the Passover in Numbers 9. It also shows up regarding how the burn offering, the ascent offering is being handled, how the drink offering, the libations are being handled. The pattern I am seeing, aside from issues of clear judgment and decision, is that it often is used to talk about some prior rule that was already given regarding an issue, the way that an issue is being handled. In general, that is what I see regarding mishpat. And now we have the word Torah, and Torah is used in at least two clear different ways. Obviously, we have the modern way that is typically used to refer to the entirety of the law, or otherwise the Pentateuch itself. And the book of Deuteronomy certainly does refer to scroll of this Torah. That is a way that it is used. It is used in reference to some sort of compilation of law. One common idea about the word Torah is in connection with the verb yara, from which is presumably derived, which is sometimes understood as to teach. And so there's this common idea that Torah itself could mean teaching. Personally, I would think this is not well supported by some of the things which go on in the text. Of course, it is the case that sometimes it could be seen that way, but what I am seeing is that the category of meaning of teach tends to be, in English, something like advice, tends to be offering knowledge that should be useful and such, not in the sense of legislation, law, and judgment, but in the Torah, in reference to the word Torah, it is clear, at least in many cases, that this is not just talking about advice that's good. In fact, this can be an issue of life and death in terms of whether someone follows it or not, and not just life and death in terms of a more abstract sense or a more overall sense, but life and death in terms of actual immediate judgment, and which is required to be adhered to on penalty of death in Deuteronomy 17, 11 through 12. And so the way that I understand the word Torah and the way that I understand the verb yara, instead of rendering that as teaching and teach, I would render it as direction and direct. I think the English category of meaning for those words is more appropriate when we're looking at the Hebrew word Torah, the Hebrew verb yara. With regard to the other patterns that show up in the text, there are a number of passages that begin by specifying that this is the effectively the Torah of some issue, or the Torah. This shows up repeatedly in Leviticus regarding the Torah of the ascent, the Torah of the burnt offering, the Torah of the tribute, the Torah of the sin offering, the Torah of the guilt offering, peace offerings, offerings in general, the cleansing of the leper or the metzorah, the jealousy offering, the fire offering, and the red heifer. And it also shows up with regard to the rules on the animals, separating between unclean and clean, the one giving birth, the rules regarding leprosy or sarat, the rules regarding discharges and flows, the rules about the nazir, the nazirite, and about cleansing after battle. And this also tends to be the word that shows up whenever we see it specifying that this rule applies to both the native and the sojourner, such as regarding the Passover commands, such as regarding the fire offering in Numbers 15, and also the one doing an error in Numbers 15. Most of the examples that show up 
tend to be centered around the offerings, tend to be centered around maintaining ritual cleanness and also the eating or not eating of certain animals, or otherwise as an apparent compilation of the laws or laws in general. With the one exception of this that I'm recognizing aside from the categories mentioned, one exception of this referring to the mon, the manna, as described in Exodus 16, seeing whether they are going to walk in his Torah or not. The last category I want to get into is Mishmaret, and this one does not appear as often as most of the other ones that we have considered. It's related to the verb which refers to keeping or observing or guarding, as I would understand it, and it shows up regarding some of the things which are being kept, such as the mon, the manna, and the ashes of the red heifer. But it does show up a few times with regard to different commands, or generally speaking, regarding commands. In Leviticus 8.35, it talks about Aaron and his sons guarding or keeping the rules surrounding the ritual of his anointment, as well as taking care of the tent of meeting, the altar, the holiness, the sanctuary, and the offerings. That appears a few different times. And also the obligations of the different clans of Levi regarding the tent of meeting and the tabernacle. And finally, the journeying or the camping because of the cloud referred to in Numbers 9 the journeying of the camps of Israel. So those are six of the words which appear in the Torah describing different commands, describing commands generally, or describing sets of commands. As mentioned, many of them appear to just refer very generally, and sometimes they are used specifically. Most of the time when any of these are used regarding a specific issue, with the possible exception of the word mishpat, many of the others refer to some type of ritual, refer to some way things are done at the tent of meeting, refer to how Aaron, the commanded priest, is supposed to handle things, or refer to commands surrounding the festivals or cleanness and uncleanness and such. And then with regard to mishpat or judgment, there are clear examples of it meaning just judgment, and there are also ways it is used which include referring back to a previous standard which was already set on issue and simply reiterating that. And then with regard to mitzvah, miswah, and mitzvot, this appears to refer to commandments in general. It does not appear to be used in reference to any specific command. With regard to all of these examples, with regard to all of these particular words, there could be a lot of overlap. There are some specialized uses that we looked at, but it also does appear to be fairly general. They are similar words with similar meanings, with some exception. Hopefully you found this useful. Guard the Hukot, guard the Hukim, guard the Miswot, guard the Mishpatim, and guard the Torah and do it.